Well, I've got 10 minutes, and I'm, I know that some of you have not been here before, so I'm going to give a, a very quick introduction to what we know before I bring my colleagues on. I want to start with a set of twins, identical twins, and uh, I'm going to come back to them uh, at the end of this little talk. My second slide is another clinical study. Some of you may recognize this drawing. I, I produced it in the, the paper I wrote on the 30th anniversary of the antiphospholipid syndrome. And this was sent to me by a patient. Um, and it, it tells, I think a lot of you will nod at this and say, yes, I recognize those things, from joint pains to circulation. Um, but I'd like to look at the top one there, fainting. This girl fainted at school, fainted a lot, collapsed. And the, the lesson from this, I'll come back to as well. So, back to 1983, this is where we wrote the first papers on the syndrome. And I, as, as my colleagues will know, there's a thing called the Heberden Society, which is a British rheumatology society. And in those days, you invited patients along and discussed with the patients, you know, what they had. And this, all these girls had various forms of lupus, but three of them had antiphospholipid syndrome, one with low platelets and a stroke, no DNA antibodies, no lupus, um, and so on. And this was the very first public presentation at the Hammersmith Hospital. The next year in the British Medical Journal, we published two big papers on thrombosis, abortion, cerebral disease, and the lupus. And I'm rather proud of it because both the first papers on this were in British journals. And some of you in the front row will know The Lancet. It took a year and a half, actually, to get this um, accepted with lots of toing and froing. But this was the first paper uh, on the antibody assay, uh, which Anasur Rahman is going to be talking about what the tests are and what they mean. And we were so excited by this. November the 26th, um, which is my birthday. So we actually all went for a, for a, a pizza down at Hammersmith in this uh, thing to celebrate what we knew actually was a very important day. A year later, we had the first World Symposium. I like the world because I think there were 47 attendees at that meeting. And since then, every two years, there's been international meetings. Well, that's a background to our side of it. And now, as you know, doctors throughout the world are collaborating in research. So for those who've not been to this meeting, just a few slides on what the symptoms are. Perhaps the commonest of all is memory loss. And often the patients don't talk about it until you ask them that, oh, I'm the joke of the family, I have to write everything down. Um, it, it's, it's quite severe and it's a big worry. Have I got Alzheimer's? I note on the radio that on television the last week there's been a lot on memory loss and this is one of the causes which fantastically is treatable. Second commonest perhaps in my clinical practice is migraine. Did you have migraine as a teenager? Yes, doctor. Every week, severe, often missed school or college. Went away for a few years, and then it came back, and it's been quite severe recently. But the brain has other ways of being angry. Uh, and a number of patients are labeled at some stage as query multiple sclerosis. And uh, on your seats, there's, there's a questionnaire for those who have the disease. It's anonymous, but we'd like to know what sort of percentage of people go to various specialties. And, and this is a very, still, I, I think my colleagues would agree, a very tricky uh, diagnostic situation. But the most severe worry, of course, is stroke. I'm getting mini strokes, I'm balance problems, I'm, I'm, uh, I, I'm concerned. And, and this, as you've heard from the introductory comments, uh, is probably one of the biggest things that we can do. We know that there's a government-run stroke uh, um, incentive now, but so far very little on the antiphospholipid Hughes syndrome. Now, there are other organs that don't like sticky blood. And if you think about it, every organ's the same. This is a patient, the arrow shows a fractured foot, metatarsal. Believe it or not, that is a feature of the syndrome. I frequently say, have you ever had a March fracture? Yes, doctor, you know, I was a jogger years ago and I fractured five times. Um, the big organs, the heart, sadly, can be involved. This is a clot inside the coronary artery. And some people, one of their main complaints is angina. In the book, uh, 
that you have outside uh, on sale. Um, there's a lot about angina and how this lady presented with chest pains. Again, very treatable. And finally, the arteries. And it's it, it really introducing us to work that, in fact, links sticky blood with perhaps cl clogging of arteries. And this is something of very exciting. This is Yehuda Schoenfels, one of the world leaders in this uh, field from Israel, and we collaborate a lot with his team. Perhaps the most newsworthy is pregnancy, and once a year in this room, we used to have a um, party for uh, uh, mothers and daughters. One of the ladies here had 14 miscarriages before being diagnosed and treated. And so we used to have this party every year until I left St. Thomas, and I always thought it was quite fun with ice cream and vomiting and you know, jelly. And... But the figures are fantastic. This is data that's reproduced throughout the world. Um, back in 85, when we were looking at this first, only 18% successful pregnancy if you had antibodies against phospholipids. And now most units are talking of 90% success or over. One of the reasons is that we do collaborative studies, and uh, this shows my colleague Dr. Kamashta, a mother with a newborn baby, and a hematologist and a pediatric doctor. So collaborative studies like this have brought up the improvement. But one of the things that I think is terribly sad and very important is that the media have, have ignored this antiphospholipid syndrome in stillbirth. The Times last year, or a year and a half ago, said that stillbirth was the greatest tragedy, or one of the greatest tragedies known to man. And um, there is an increased chance of stillbirth if you're sticky blood and not treated. And a very good group in America, where Branches Group, have shown this. So when you or your daughter or a friend goes for the first visit to the obstetrics department, um, do they ask about antiphospholipid syndrome? No, they don't. Do they test? No, they don't. Could you predict who would need a test? Because at the moment, you have to wait for three miscarriages uh, to be eligible to test. And that's on economic grounds, apparently. But for me, it's, it's very sad. And I've proposed uh, a lot in publications. Oh, it's stopped going. Yeah, three, I mean, any midwife or doctor in obstetrics should ask these three questions. Have you had a thrombosis? Are you a migraine sufferer? And do you have a family history, it's so important, uh, of autoimmune disease, that means lupus, rheumatoid, MS, and thyroid disease? Which brings me to the last couple of slides, really, and that is the treatment, which is going to be talked about by colleagues. Aspirin, traditionally, for those without major problems, but um, heparin and warfarin for those who've had a major clot. And this cartoon showed, showed it at the last meeting, but it's something that epitomizes what we see. Many of our patients need a higher INR. I always think of Tesco's milk. It's got to be uh, you know, thin milk, not thick milk. And the ratio has got to be 3.5 or even more in, and I'm sure some of you in the audience run along nicely at four. And if the INR falls, back come the symptoms of headaches, whatever. For that reason, it's been a feature of this meeting that we have had speakers on self-testing. And where appropriate, I'm a real fan of this. It's my religion. I think if you can afford the 350 or whatever it is for a machine, it opens up your life. You can travel, you can uh, do normal things. So what's this patient teaching us? Well, it teaches us, amongst other things, that uh, it need not be Hughes syndrome alone. Hughes syndrome can be linked with other things. And I talk about the big three, thyroid, lazy thyroid, Hughes syndrome, and Sjogren's, which is aches and pains. And those three go in tandem all the time. But a new one has been described in the last five years, and that is POTS, P-O-T-S. And POTS is... Oh, it goes for postural orthostatic tachycardia, which in plain English, when you stand up, you faint. Oh, the heart goes funny. And it's due to a slightly abnormal nervous system, autonomic nervous system that monitors these things. So these poor patients come to a regular doctor with 50 different things and are assumed to be uh, neurotic. And, and so many cases, 
that's not true. Well, to finish, we have the twins. Uh, these, um, Jane, who's strongly positive antiphospholipid antibodies. And this slide really is for Anisur, who's going to be talking about testing next. And her identical twin, absolutely identical, was Sarah, and she was negative. Now, Jane had all the features of a few syndrome, migraine, balance problems, temporal lobe epilepsy, that's getting funny feelings and deja vu, and memory loss. Her sister, who's APL negative, had this identical picture, migraine, balance problems, temporal lobe, memory loss. What should we do with Sarah? Well, the answer is, of course, you treat. And we started her on aspirin, later heparin, and now she's completely well, asymptomatic, on warfarin. What's this patient teaching us? Well, we're still a little naive in testing, and I, I think this is important that you hear the next talk, because uh, it's not all that it seems. And there are, and it's a passion of mine, that there are patients who clinically fit the bill totally. They're often relatives of patients already diagnosed or family members, uh, and whom the tests are negative. And what happens, the patients, sadly, are often sent away. And we call it seronegative. And that's simply because, well, the tests are negative. What's the importance of that? Well, you do wonder out there in the world of medicine how many patients with migraine have got Hughes syndrome and have not been picked up. How many recurrent pregnancy losses because the tests are borderline or negative. How many young strokes and heart attacks? How many unexpected fractures? Who would think of that? And stillbirth and atypical MS. These are opening up, and such is the importance of testing that we hope to get better at it. So we wrote um, 33 years ago, the, um, the syndrome widens. We think we have a better understanding of the mechanisms, although internationally people are working on this. I believe that this business of zero negative or the test being negative is one of the most fundamental important aspects of our syndrome. And although in conferences a lot of people don't like the topic, uh, it's a real one that hits us as busy clinicians. So in 1983, I wrote, for those of us hardened by nihilism and years of study of various autoantibodies in SLE, there's a rare sense of excitement at the implications of the associations now being reported. And that's the same today, I think. Thank you very much.